Hello everyone, I am Angie and I am recording from Turrible Land. And I'm Evie, I'm recording from Wurundjeri Land. And welcome. welcome back to Two Girls, One Pod. Um, this week is uh, going to be um, a very fun yet sad Emotional, all the feels, um, a little episode on our friend, housemate, oh, family member, support work, like we were support workers for him, our friend Thomas Hancock, who passed away last Wednesday. Um, we'd firstly like to yeah. mention that we are going, we are doing this episode about Tom with permission from his mum, Rachel Haggett, which we will also be touching on her and her amazing work and how Tom came into our lives. So um there's so much to talk about. So let's let's just let's just do it. Let's do it for Tom. Well, let's start at the end. Tom passed yes. away last week. Yeah. And we got news just after we recorded um mm. actually. Yeah. Last week's episode. So that was a, a really hard day for us. One of the best well there's always a silver lining and everything and the silver lining in this straight up is that Tom didn't suffer and that was no. our biggest, the whole family, everyone that's ever known anyone like Tom or Tom himself, you, you know, anyone with an intellectual disability, you do not want them to be frightened at the end no. and he wasn't. So it looks like which he had a heart say. attack, um, yeah. which is because of his, you know, many ailments which we'll go through. Um, we lost him Suddenly, and for everyone, we've lost him way too early. Yes. He was about a decade ahead of what everyone predicted. Down mm. syndrome, um, people, their life spans have actually doubled since we took them out of institutions. Yeah. Um, and they used to be about 30, 35, and now it's over 60. So for Tom, we always thought probably 50s because 50, Tom has type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So there was always this fear... Yeah, of him yeah. losing, starting to lose limbs or go blind or go deaf over a yes. long period. You know, that's kind of what you're you're told. Obviously, we're not, we're mere yeah. mortals in this situation. We don't know the bigger picture. But that's what we always kind of envisioned knowing Tom and his health. And um, But, yeah, to, to lose him so unexpectedly was a real hmm. shock because only – Three days before uh, it was his 42nd birthday, um, I was. got to FaceTime him. So I just count my lucky stars and thank my angels that I did do that. I normally do it every year, but I, you know, there was just a, there's a lot going on and things happen. But I did. I thought about it at five o'clock and I was like, oh my God, it's today. And we got to have a beautiful FaceTime. And that is kind of going to live rent-free in my mind in a good way, I think, for a very long time. And then just a few days later, um, yeah, we found out that he is no longer with us. Um, but shall we start off with how we even know this little prince? Yeah. I was living in Elizabeth Bay and I was suffering really bad autoimmune disease at the time. And um, I slept most of the day because what came with it was also chronic fatigue syndrome. And I made a friend through other friends and this particular man, his name was Martin, he, he probably still is, Martin, he <laughs> said um, that he was living um, with, he was, he had just moved in with this man who had Down syndrome and he has two bedrooms on either side of him and he has flatmates but you get free rent for this is him telling me you know oh yeah you get you should do this because it would really help you would be able to recover and um, not have to pay rent and all you have to do is make sure he eats well and look after his medicine and I'm like oh yeah okay I actually went over and met Tom and his mum and then decided not to do it. I was just like, this is, I don't think I'm good. I'm going to be any good at this. I think mm. this is going to be a lot of responsibility and which, you know, fast forward ended up being the same way you were thinking about it, but we'll get to that. And then I was just hanging out over there a few times with Martin and Tom and I got to know, and I was like, oh my God, I can totally do this. Like, I can totally do this. This is a great situation. So I moved myself in and 
Um, Martin and I were his flatmates for a while and then Martin left and I already knew you. You'd already met Martin and yes, we had a beach you, day with the dogs. Yeah, that's right. And then I was like, you know what? In my mind, my sneaky little mind, I'm like, hmm, who do I want to live with? Like, yeah. who do I want to do this job with? Because it's a job, but it's a, a very specific type of living. And you can't, it's not just having a flatmate. You have to have someone that you can rely on. Mm-hmm. someone that you get along with and someone that's going to really respect the process of living with Tom. And um, I just thought our, uh, I didn't know you that well but we'd caught up a few times and um, you were so lovely and I just thought I would like to spend more time with her. Like there was just this affinity we had even though we had such a massive age difference. Yeah. Um, Every time we saw each other, we would just laugh and laugh. And I'm like, I think this is what I need, someone who has the same sense of humour as me. Um, I found out pretty quickly that Tom had a pretty rank sense of (laughs) (laughs) humour. Oh, my God, did he ever. Did he ever. And someone that was going to love, because by that time I had started, you know, looking into dog fostering because Tom was a mad dog lover. He was as... Mad as I am for dogs. Loved them. So we needed someone who was going to really fit into that. And and I started asking you over for a little and then I'd be like, oh, I've got a wedding to go to. Do you want to come and babysit, not babysit, dog sit and, you know, hang out? And that was my test. Yes, I was I like, if she test. can handle this, if she can handle this, I'm going to then talk her into it. And I had to talk you into it because you had a sweet little deal living with Morgan and your cousin and, you know, you felt a little bit bad leaving them but you, like me, thought, okay, I can't do this. This is a bit too much and you, like me, once started hanging out there went, oh, I could totally do this. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Is that correct? That's so correct. I was living with my cousin. I think Morgan had moved out at this point and I was like, I'm leaving my cousin so hard. We've always wanted to live together but Mm – Rent was so expensive and I was studying. No, I was interning full time for mm. documentary production and then working in promo and nannying. And then you were like, you you get, you don't have to worry about rent anymore. And you love Tom mm. and Tom loves you and you love dogs and you love hanging out with me. And I was like, gosh, I'm only 23. And it's like taking on a role where he's not just your housemate. Mm. He's almost like your, your child that you care for. But then he turns mm. into your best friend. And I just mm. thought, you know what? I'm going to do it. And it seriously changed my entire life. I don't know Mm. hardly anybody uh, in their 20s that moved in to, we called it our perfect modern family. There was Evie Jones, who was, you know, Mm. a good 17 years older than me. There was me. We were both single. Then over time we just, and then we had Tom who had Down syndrome and type 1 diabetes, and then we just started accumulating rescue dog after rescue dog. And it was this perfect, dysfunctional, cooked, quirky, modern-day family, and it just was chaotic, but it just worked because we turned that Mm. space into a home. We were a family. Mm. We would fight like brothers and sisters, and people would often look at us and be like, because you can't talk to Tom like that. Like, he doesn't get that. And Tom loved us because we spoke to him Mm. how we would speak to each other. He was our best friend. He was our brother. But unfortunately, we did have to boss him around a little bit more because, you know, with diabetes comes (laughs) a lot of health risks and hypoglycemic attacks Mm. and, you know, uh, losing limbs and things if he eats the wrong things eventually. So there was that part where we did have to step in and be, you know, that caring figure. But it was... The best. And it was around the time that I then started studying full-time film television um, at Metro Screen. And I just got a message actually from one of my lecturers and he said, I I remember Tom and you would light up when you pitched your documentary idea, Tom's plan. He was your muse at that part of your life. And I was like, oh my God, he, Tom was my muse. I, I lived and breathed wanting to promote this this idea of that Tom's mum, Rachel, came up with of assisted living where able bodies and people with a disability live together. And I created this documentary called Tom's Plan and I would put it in all these film festivals and everyone that worked and filmed with Tom over that period just 
fell in love with him and I never thought of him as being my muse, but he really was. And I think people think, oh my gosh, you know, how do you give up your 20s and how do you, like, that's so much responsibility because he could be naughty sometimes, let's not pretend. It wasn't always sunshine and roses and lollipops. And I thought, Mm. well, you know what? He gives me so much in return, living in the moment, um, just the adventures, the absolute love. I said to my dad, I think, the other day, he's the only straight man that has just loved me unconditionally. Like I could do a massive Mm. fart and just be in the most feral (laughs) mood and have no makeup on and Tom would just look at me like I was bloody Mm. the princess of the world, wouldn't he? He Mm. just, he just. He would. He, he thought I was just bloody Angelina Jolie, anything. He, I've just never felt that type of unconditional love and I feel we got so much out of it in return and it was our own little world even, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was, it, yeah, I mean, you you know, people, you were just saying then, you know, people would think, why would you give up your 20s? You didn't give up really anything. Mm-hmm. You gained so I much. Gained. And that's what a lot of people um you know, the funny thing is, we're, and whenever we would tell people of our living situation, everyone would be like, oh, my God, like, why doesn't this happen more often? Yes. And it was a question that everyone that knew of the situation would ask and go, well, because it takes a lot of funding. And Rachel, Tom's mum, um, her and her husband, Ken, they um, were in a financial situation, you know, position to be able to buy Tom a house and no one mostly is no. in that position. So no, but by doing that, they showed how this model could work if the government supported this kind of an initiative where they could have public housing mm. where it's... Subsidised rent. It's a different subsidised rent Um the, the other thing is that people, you know, we were Tom's flatmates first yes. and foremost. De- definitely. Um, Tom had ca- carers. Tom had carers come mm. to take him out through the day. Um, so we could live a normal life if we wanted and everyone that's lived with Tom has been able to have either a full-time job or study. Before me um, and Martin there had been about maybe six different um, – he'd gone through uh, – He'd gone through. <laughs> He'd gone through quite a few flatmates, but um, in particular, his favourite, I think, flatmate next to Angie was Tom. Um, Tom. Tom is Tom. Scott Thompson. <laughs> Scott Thompson actually started. He, he was started. Tom's Sucky very boy. first flatmate. Mm. Mm. And he had started that 13 years before I had been living with Tom. So that's God. when Tom was 21. I yeah. was um, 39 when I moved in and – because I, I remember having my 40th um, birthday while I was living with Tom. Yes. And, yeah, so Scott was wonderful to have because Rachel had this this group of people that knew Tom, had known Tom most of his life and she called them the circle. So yes. you could depend on these people and if you didn't live with Tom anymore because you weren't in the circle if you lived with Tom, it was for people outside to – kind of surround you and Tom in this circle and Mm -hmm. Scott became part of the circle once he stopped living with. So he was actually a great source of um, advice for me and support. Like if I didn't want to talk to Rachel about something that was happening at home or I had Scott to talk to and um, he was just a really beautiful man. Still is an absolute gem of a man. Divine. He had lived in that situation in London. So it was him that actually brought this idea to Rachel and, you know, Rachel kind of making this, Rachel and Ken making this decision at such um, an an age for Tom where you would normally have your 21-year-old son moving out of home or thinking about moving out of home. Most people had to have to still have their um, intellectually disabled adult child live with them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Um, and that was something that Rachel fortunately had other options and she took them and she really did. And the, the one thing I'll have to say about Rachel that I loved the most was that even though she was financially in a situation, she never stopped applying for things that she knew if she got them through, 
other people, other people who were could. lower on the socioeconomic, yeah, they could get yep. it. She was often the first to push for things she through would. the end, well, before the NDIS and yeah, through um, you know our government and disability sector. She would really push for things that she knew she could pay for herself, but she knew if she was the one pushing, there'd be someone who maybe couldn't fill out a form as well, someone who couldn't maybe speak um, English, wasn't their first language. Yes. She was making it so it was easier for these people to apply for these things because there was a demand for them. She was a real trailblazer in that particular way. And not just in that regard, but the fact when she started all of this, a lot of parents would look down on her and say, how could you let your d- mm-hmm. child with a disability live with strangers? Like, you're just giving him away and giving him up. And Rachel would always say, yeah. I don't think that my young 21-year-old son wants to live with his ageing parent. He's seeing his mm-hmm. sister Molly move over to the UK and his brother moving to New York to be an artist. Tom wanted to be out there like his brother's brother and sister and that's exactly yeah. what Rachel did so even though she was such a trailblazer in that sense she still had to cop all that mother guilt that mummy shaming of yeah. handing over the responsibility from her own friends too from her own friends and from other people mm. with you know children yeah. that had disabilities and she just never stopped fighting the good fight and even now speaking to her the other day she uh, gave me a little bit of an update because originally it was called home enterprise uh that where it started over in the uk this whole um living situation with able bodies and people with a disability and then rachel brought home community over here to pitch it and she'd always be at board meetings for the inner west council and she'd always be fighting the good fight um it is actually still going now. So you, if, if you are in the inner west of Sid- Sydney, it is called Together Two and they have kind of like little apartment blocks. I think there's six apartment blocks where you can live with uh, together with Able and people with a disability, which is great. Um, but apparently they're all over. The sad part is all over Australia, but the sad part is there's not enough funding, there's not enough noise mm. about it, and so many people mm. don't know that there is these opportunities out there. So we're going to post links to Home Community, uh, Together To, uh, my documentary Tom's Plan, even though it's old school as f- and it's a little bit, you know, hello 2000 and what, whatever it was, 13. <laughs> um, but it has such good information there to see and you get to hear from um, Rachel in that one. I'm not sure, so sure Rachel, but Rachel gets to speak on uh, we did a project piece as well and Evie did a, a Studio 10 piece on the whole living arrangement of Tom. So we'll, po- we'll post that in the show notes because that will give you more of an understanding of it all um, because it is truly just heaven sent and I just I just really do hope more people realise that your child can be safe with somebody else, your child on the spectrum or if they have a disability and they just get to live a life so full, even though Tom's was cut short, he had a better bloody social life than I did, he had more bloody friends than I did, he went on more holidays than anyone I knew and he just... He lived the dream and more people deserve this opportunity and I just feel so blessed and grateful that I got to be a part of this and it it came at a time as well where I was battling so terribly with my demons and my eating disorder and my anxiety and whatever I had going on and was numbing or didn't know about it. Tom came into my life at a point where I kind of forgot about that because I was caring for him. Mm -hmm. I had something else to care about. And it was kind of healing Mm. in a sense. And I was saying to my cousin the other day that I've, you know, you and I have both lost friends. We've both lost family. We know that deep, deep, heartbroken pain of losing someone you love. But it's this different feeling as a woman. I'm sure a lot of uh, people with wombs would experience the mourning of losing somebody that you just you cared for almost as a child um, in some regard so deeply that it's just this different feeling that my womb like aches and I started bleeding as soon as I heard the news. It's just like you're, this whole somatic response of my body just being like, oh, you're mourning him as a part of you that's that nurturing mother feeling and I've never experienced it before and it really – rattled me. So I'm really sitting with that because it's like 
I don't know when that feeling's going to come back, you know? Um, I don't know. It's just it's just such a different feeling and, you know, you go through all the, the videos and the images and you remember the good times but, and then you just think like, you know, you're never going to have that little phone the picture of his face and Tom Hancock p- popping up on the screen calling or, you know, when I go back to Sydney and film, you know, we'd go out for dinners and my my real home in Sydney was Stanmore and to know that we can't go back there now, you know, and he's not there, yeah. that's something that often plays in my head. It's still so fresh and I know time heals all but it's just been, yeah, it's been such a different morning process. I don't know if you feel that as well within you, that it's just a different feeling. Yeah, I feel like I've lost a brother. Yeah. And, you know, I have, I didn't keep in touch with him nearly enough and I wish I had. So it's a very good lesson. It is a lesson. Yeah. To, you know, reach out to those you love because you never know when they're going to be gone. And when the last time you speak to them is going to be. I think it'd be good if we chat a little bit about the good he, times. <laughs> who he was. Tom Tom was born on the 13th of May 1982, and he was, by all accounts, the most beautiful little baby oh. and toddler I've ever seen. Now, we've seen film of him, video of him as a baby. My goodness, he was the cheekiest, funnest little boy. And I got to meet him when he was uh, 29. So, (laughs) you know, he was still this cheeky man that loved his football. Oh, yeah. Loved his magazines. He (laughs) loved... Back then in the day, the magazines that were still going, they're not, I don't think they're going anymore, are they? People and picture magazines like that where, you know, you have a few homegirls on the back pages. Oh, he (laughs) loved those, didn't he? (laughs) It's really funny. The irony is Angie and I are such (laughs) feminists. We really don't, you know, partake in the cishet male (laughs) world. But Tom was the epitome of a straight white man. Oh, he loved, he his, loved footy, his footy, yeah. loved his porn. <laughs> <laughs> loved his food. And he lo- loved his food, loved the pub and thought men were better than women. Oh, he just, loved men. Just as a general rule, loved he, men. He'd loved arm them. wrestle any boyfriend or potential suitor oh. that would come oh. over. He'd be like, and take his shirt off. And he'd go, want to oh. wrestle? Yeah. And I'd be like, oh. <laughs> And then I'd look at them. It would be a test almost. I'd look at them and I'd be like, I mean, do you want to? And they'd be like, I don't know, can I? And I was like, well, he asked you. And I would watch them squirm as this shirtless man that's only like, what, five foot two. Yeah, He was teeny tiny. And just try to arm wrestle all these potential suitors. And I'd go, well, well well done. Look at you two fellas just arm wrestling. (laughs) Both of you take your shirts. He would just do. He was very... The funniest threatened thing. by your, your – any men that Angie brought around, that they were huge threats. You'll see on the – we'll po- pop up the project um, interview that you did and he's in it and it's like he is just mortified. He – him and I were so mortified to watch you pashing men on oh, screen for I two ever. completely different reasons too. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, for me it's like watching – yep. Your sister up, Mac on for him. Oh, it was like I watching like his girlfriend, yeah, the love of his life, oh, kissing right. all these other men, and he was like, "Oh, it's embarrassing." He was <laughs> so embarrassed. He every single phone call or update or any time I saw him, he'd have to tell any anybody. And still to this day, I am the most embarrassing person because I kissed boys on television. Oh, oh look, I, I have to say, I have. I, I see exactly where it's coming from. When, you know, I almost feel like going and becoming The Bachelor just so you have to watch me make on oh, and no. see and watch how, see how you Ooh, feel about it. And it was always so like Jamie Mac on TV. Yeah. I know. No, it was so, like, it was, 
it, like really, you know, our TVs these days are huge. So Tom and I had to watch you. <laughs> Just like full, really go to town. Large head. Yeah, oh, tongue. The, the smacking Tom. that. Oh yeah, he would he would have been it would have been so hard for him to watch, but he did and he loved you. And and he knows, he knew, he always knew that you he was your number one guy anyway. And he could take down any bloke that you brought over. He would take his shirt off and he'd arm wrestle them. So, you know, that's what you get. And he'd try to embarrass me, so it would be almost be like, so they would stop liking me. They'd be like, yeah. if we took him out for dinner, he'd be like, oh, Angela. He never called me Angie. It was always Angela or Angelie. Yep. Angela, Angela, um, Angela, sometimes she, and he'll make up a story. Sometimes she just, yes. you know, be naked and she'll fart. And I'm, like, I'm <laughs> just like, that right, never happened. It probably right. did, but you did not have to share that story right now. At, at any point, he'd love just to embarrass me. And it was just iconic. Yeah. He was a good. He was a good egg. We went on holidays with him. We'd we um, been to Bali twice with him. I've been to Fiji. You've been to London. Like what a haul! Oh, My goodness, I would year. never have said yes to something like that. It was like twenty four hours for you to get to London, flying with but Tom. You've certainly paid for it. <laughs> it may oh, have been a God. free flight for you, but you paid for it. <laughs> it's oh. twenty four hours with Tom on a plane, on a flight, the, checking his blood, the snoring, and the yeah. He oh was, gosh! And yeah, every he, time I would get up, slow he walk. would. He, this, yeah, he was very. He loved oh God, to he take his slow. sweet ass time. But every time I'd get up to go <sighs> to the toilet, he would then sit next to the person because I'd make sure I was the one in between people because he would just like fall asleep on their shoulder or scream at the movie mm. at the top of his lungs when everyone was sleeping. So I was oh, like, yeah. "You sit on the end, and I'll oh, sit." Yeah. And he'd get up and he'd sit next to the person and start talking to them. And I'm like, "Tom, no one wants to talk yeah. on a flight." No. For hours, and then he wouldn't get up. <laughs> I would say to him, get up. You know, like a mum does with a kid, and then I'd have yeah, to, I didn't want people yeah. to see me. And then I'd get in his ear and I'd go, get up right now. And he'd go, no. Nah. And I'd be like, well, I can't kick off. I'm on a plane for the next 17 hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he oh. certainly knew how, and he loved his routine, Tom. He always he had us through the week and then he would go and see his mum after he'd go to, um, he used to go to a day centre. Yeah. Well, he used to go to Ella in yes, another day Ella. centre for in, right. for um, disability adults and then he started, he was always at Roselle. Roselle was a Saturday um, like a, a creative program for um, adults with disabilities and he had been going there forever, like ever since he was a teenager. So he had this group of friends there that were, I mean, just oh, a lively bunch of people that, were just so beautiful. We got to know all of his friends, all of his family. He was born in Balmain and he lived with us in Stanmore Lake. So if you know inner west of Sydney, you know you that know they're Tom. only about four suburbs away. Oh, and everybody yeah, knew everyone Tom. Everyone knew Tom. Everyone. Yeah. He would just everyone. like walk the streets and be Tom and he'd move, oh, yeah. sometimes and sometimes no. And gosh, he'd get us into some trouble too because of his diabetes. He'd yes. go to the local bakeries and he'd be tended, he'd be he'd be having a hypoglycemic yes. attack. So Evie had to make him hand out flyers saying, Don't feed me sugar. Don't I am a diabetic. Because he'd come home with little white bits all dropped down his top. We knew he'd be <laughs> smashing right. buns, jam <laughs> buns. And it would be so funny because you'd be like, What have you eaten? Oh, and he'd say, I'm sorry, I ate a cake. Yeah. And you'd say, how do you feel? And he'd go, oh, I don't feel very good. I don't feel good. He never lied. He would always say to you, you know, I ate, I ate a cake. I had a go, cake. I don't like, like it. How do you feel so, about that? Yeah. And he'd say, I don't, I don't like it. I don't feel good at all. And I'm like, well, that's what you get. But I do understand, Tom, because you know what? I have binge, ordering, <laughs> binge oh. eating disorder. So, so I kind of know it. what it's like to want that was to eat all this thing. sugar. To it's have to constantly tell to this that. Yeah. man that he couldn't eat things that he wanted and his friends could eat, but it wasn't because we were being mean. Yeah. It's because he dropped so low and his hypoglycemic attacks were so frightening. Anybody that has diabetes or knows somebody with diabetes knows how scary those attacks are. And he would wake yeah. us up through the night screaming bloody murder and he wasn't himself and he was so strong and he could throw you up against yeah. a wall or put on a whole theatre yeah. performance while you're trying <laughs> to throw jelly beans and toast into his gob yeah. and not bite your little fingers off. Like, it it was a whole thing yeah. and it was it was madness but it was our world 
And I feel like so many people would be like, how did you do that? And it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Like seriously. Yeah, you just you you just deal with whatever you're presented with in life. Oh, and humans and that was what we resilient. were presented with that time. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't I mean that was one of the reasons I forced you yeah. <laughs> to do it with me. Because I'm like, I need someone that's going to laugh as much as me at some situations that could probably make you cry. Make if you, you want to laugh. Yeah, you know need d- deep and there therapy. Were, there were things that I mean, we have ha- we have some memories that we will go all of our lives on. Like we will be able to tap into these memories and start laughing to the point where we will start to cry because it, they are so funny. They're just so – and Tom loved our humour and how much we treated him like a brother. Like we would yeah. give him such a hard time and he would get this smile on his face. Like he knew we were so enamoured with him and we mm. would pick on him because it wasn't – you know when you make fun of someone or you make fun? We would always yes. make fun with yes. him and he was – he was never the butt of a joke, but he was the the I guess the pizza resistance of a joke because he loved anything that was about him and yes, um, you'd see this little smile curl up on the side of his mouth and you'd know he's really enjoying this. Like it didn't matter. Now one of the fa- my favourite memories with Tom is every birthday Tom would always have all of his mm-hmm. people around yeah. um, it would either be a pub or it'd be um, at his mum's place we, this this also included Christmas yes um, there was always a Christmas circle event Christmas party and a birthday mm. party so what Tom would do is he would say he wanted to go around and get everyone after we'd done the cake and sang happy birthday to him uh, he would say um, I'd like to make a speech so he'd make a speech and it was always very heartfelt, uh, very hard to understand if you didn't know Tom. That was the other yeah. thing about Tom was that he was extremely hard to understand because his speech was very slurred and at times almost indecipherable. Like, But mm. we knew his language very well. Everyone that knew him knew his language and very you knew well. What but he if was you thinking. didn't, we, we were great yeah. at uh, Yeah, Interpre- yeah. And yeah. We, we would always yeah. be able to interpret him. But he would have us each go one at a time put his hand on your shoulder whoever was in up up in the spotlight God pop his hand you. on your shoulder and he would say so let's say me and Angie sitting next to each other he'd pop his hand on Angie's shoulder and he would say to everyone uh, this is Angie and she's a lovely lady yeah. and she's a very uh, lovely lady and uh, Angie what do you think of me <laughs> You would have to say what you loved about this this man and he would say after every adjective pretty much that you'd come up with, he'd go, you see, because that was Tom's favourite saying was, you see. Yeah. And he'd look at everyone else and go, you see. See? And it would be so infuriating because you're like, (laughs) you smug little bastard, you are just so (laughs) frigging funny with this. But then he'd move on to the next person and he'd pop Mm -hmm. his hand like, say that would be me, pop his hand on my shoulder. And he'd go, everyone, this is Evie. And she's a very lovely lady. She's a lovely lady. Um, and she's a very she's lovely lady. Lovely. And uh, what do you, you want to say about me? <laughs> and then I so would I would say would all the, pretty the much same. the same stuff that you yeah. yeah we would copy just paste say the same things. But we would say, I would say, Tom, I love living with you because you love dogs and yeah. you're very funny and you're very kind. And when we go out, we always have a laugh together. And he would go. You see? You see? You see? I'm the best. He's pretty much saying to you, you see, I'm the the king. I'm the best. It was like clockwork. Every year we would do that and you better have your speech ready otherwise, God, would he not be happy. And he loved to kick off, our Tommy. He loved to kick off. One year I said, Tom, we do this every year. Let's not do this this year. And he kicked off. 
Oh, yeah. He'd be like, no, me. I like it, I like it. And it was funny because I would always go, no, we're not doing it. We're not going to do it. And he'd, and Rachel, his mum, would always go, okay, Tom, let's do it. And I'd be like, oh. He wins every let's time. Let's do it. Just, because it was so like brothers and sisters. Like yeah. just, it's like, oh, he always gets oh. what he wants. <laughs> he wants. Yeah, he's so spoiled. Oh, but he loved his routine. He loved what he loved. He loved the same thing and it didn't matter how millions of times you could say mm. the same word and it didn't matter to Tom. Every Sunday night Rachel would bring him home and she would he would make her tell me his entire weekend. Oh, yeah. I lived with Tom for eight years uh, and you lived with him for about three mm-hmm. and but stayed in our lives, uh, became yes. a carer for other of his, his friends. Yes. Yeah, and him too. I did my course so I could continue. Mm-hmm. Um, Rachel actually suggested it because she was like, you hang yeah. out with him all the time. You should get paid now. You you don't live yeah. there. And I was like, oh, my God, getting paid to hang out with Tom. You're so polluted. And then I took on his friends as well. So there'd be like a crew of Tom and his uh, other friends with Down syndrome and me just going to the pubs, going to drama club, going to the movies. But it was always yeah. generally the same routine. They love their little routines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they certainly do. They all have their own little quirks. And I think that, you know, we now have a new government. When I moved in with Tom, we had a Labor government. We were, had the Gillard government and she made huge changes to the NDIS and we got all this funding approved, Rachel, you know, um, home. And it was so exciting. I remember it all happening. And then Rudd got back in, Gillard was overturned and the funding was taken away almost immediately. I remember it, it happening and how devastated everyone was in that mm. in that community. Um, and it was just such a shame because then we got a Liberal government and then it was cut exponentially. And yeah. it, that's, that's how it remained for the next nine years. Um, and then I wasn't living with Tom anymore. We now have a, a Labor government again and the NDIS is being looked at again. They do have a supported living program happening in Hurlston Park in the inner west, which is fantastic. But this thing, this model could go out throughout the country. Yeah. So if this is something that you're interested in, we think it would be a great idea for you to get in touch with your federal government, with our federal government or your local government, because we mostly have um, Labor governments now who do support these kind of schemes. Um, Supported independent living is what it's called. It's best suited for participants who have high support needs. A lot of people with a disability move into group homes Tom's family knew he was not going to be suited in a group home. He would get um, probably neglected a little bit because he had such high support needs. Um, If supported independent living um, is the most appropriate support for you and your um, family member or friend, you will receive funding for this assistance as part of your NDIS plan. So you can apply for this. The amount of supported independent living funding you receive will depend on the level and type of support you need to live as independently as you, as your family member can. Um, It's funded under core supports, Mm -hmm. assistance with daily life in your NDIS plan. So core supports is where you want to go and make your application. The NDIS does not fund the cost of rent, board, transport and other day-to-day expenses such as foods. They're looking to get this build to rent homes which would help so many people across the country. I think that this would be a really great match for the middle-aged women homelessness crisis that we're currently having and have been having now for over a decade in this country. There are women whose husbands have left them or they've left their husbands. They've not got enough super. They've had um, their house has been taken away and they've only ended up with half of the house and some of them live in refuges, some of them live in halfway houses, some of them live in their cars. Yeah. There are all, all of these women now who I think would really benefit from a program like this where they live and either subsidise rent or free rent 
while taking care of not just disability, I think this would work in the aged care sector as well, yeah. people who aren't ready to go into care. Um, this is a good little match for, and if it's done properly, if it's done through the government, then this is something that we can keep going and will only get bigger and will only get better. Because I don't know anyone who doesn't know someone who has, has a, a family member a, with a yeah. disability. Yeah. And... It's not just, you know, Down syndrome. We, you know, have so many. You have cerebral palsy. You have high-spectrum autism. You have so many spectrums. Um, people who would really benefit from living within the community rather than with other disability adults in a group mm. home. Uh, group homes can be terribly... Uh, hygi- like, um, what's the word I'm, I'm, I'm looking for? Like, clinical. Like, they're yes. just... They're not homely, no. are they? No, it's a place where you think so, you go before you not pass away, but it's just very – it's got this morbid vibe to it. I'm sure not all of them, but that's what you think when you think of um, yeah. group homes. It's not personal. Quite, it's not personal. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's right. And they can be quite overcrowded or underfunded. To take care of these people as en masse as a country I think is something honourable to do and something that we are owed – we are owed – these people to do because they didn't yeah, choose this life. They didn't. And we need to take care of them because they are valuable members of our society and they often have jobs, often what they oh, give yeah. to us. Tom was an incredibly talented artist. You can mm. see his artwork. We can share that. He, him and his brother, who is a professional artist, they were very gifted. They are very mm. – t- his brother James is very gifted still and Tom was a very gifted artist. So it, it's amazing what you get from these members of society. You think that they can be a drain. They're not. They are completely inspiring. I think if people have a look at the way we created our living situation and all the beautiful memories we've been sharing recently and we'll, we'll post um, some of the – videos um, and links in the show notes. It's not a job. It's not a responsibility. Of course, there's responsibility and job-like elements to it, but it is a family and you have so much love and create so many memories. So if you look at it like that and you're all helping each other out, that's where the magic will happen. And we'll put a lot of this information in the show notes and we could go on and on forever and ever. But I do want to... Um, kind of obviously sum this episode up with just saying like a huge thank you to Tom for all the memories and I know so many people are going to miss him and everybody and the beautiful messages I'm yet to even open or comments and I'm going to share that with his family and we've got a beautiful celebration of his life coming up and it's not going to be a funeral, it's going to be a party and there's going to be karaoke and his sister-in-law, Lenka, who he loved, is performing. She's an artist, singer, and it's just going to be such a beautiful day and we looked after Tom for so long but my dad said something so beautiful the other week when I just found out that Tom passed is that now it's his turn to look after us and he can be mm-hmm. our little guardian angel from heaven and I just thank Rachel for, you know, and you, Evie, for, you know, convincing me almost to move in there because if I didn't then I never would have a heart this full and all these memories and have other people know Tom and have memories shared with him and he left his little mark on so many people and um, for that I'm just forever grateful and I will miss him more than words can explain but I know he's with his dad now who he loved so much so we love you very much Tommy and anybody that's been touched by somebody like Tom or had somebody like Tom in their lives um we're, you know, thinking of you and we're, we'll share all this information about supported living and, um, yeah, gosh, what a time, what a beautiful 11 years of my life and I wouldn't change a thing. Well said. I think we can leave yeah. it at that, my Anjali. <laughs> um, rest in peace, Tom. Yes. We will love you forever. We do. We love you forever. And as Tom would always say, that's the way you're doing. <laughs> it's the way you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening Thank to us. Thank you for us listening, this everyone. Week. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week. We'll be um, back to our normal schedule. And um, we really, really 
do appreciate all of the messages that we've yeah, received divine. from you. Um, it's been, they've been our biggest posts, um, are absolutely inundated. So um, apologies if we can't get back to all of you, but we read every single word yes. and we feel every single um every single feeling that you send our way. So yes. I love you, Tommy. I'll miss you forever. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs> Lots of love. <laughs>